in the real estate finance world, uh, give you a quick current environment. First of all, you're going to see a lot of recurring themes here. The need for yield and way too much money out there trying to chase it. So um, you've heard a lot about the, the Europe sovereign debt crisis. It's, it's rattled the markets and creating, again, a need for uh, someplace stable to go. Um, when you look at the, the two-year swap spread, for example, which is the, that's the gauge of risk uh, and fear in the debt markets, that rose to a, uh, a year high on August 23rd. And again, sending investors back towards treasuries and, and seeking, um, seeking some safety. Spreads have widened. When treasuries go down, spreads widen and capture all of that, um, that difference back. The, the good news is overall lending rates are still very good. I, I continue to be amazed at how we get downgraded as a country, but our treasuries are now worth more. I still haven't been able to reconcile that. Um, U.S. property sales uh, are doing a lot better than they were last year. Uh, we're 97 billion year to date compared to about 50 billion for the same period. However, we're still uh, a lot lower than we were in previous years. Uh, banks are lending. Jim will tell you that. Portfolio lenders are lending. There's a lot of demand out. I mean, there's a lot of supply out there for new loans, but there's not as much demand. Uh, CMBS market is is back and, you know, $21 billion year to date uh, volume. I don't think they're going to hit the 35 to 40 billion that they had hoped to because primarily the, the latest disruption in the capital markets. And, um, but there's a lot of money out there and lenders really want to lend. They're being very smart about their underwriting parameters. They're being very aggressive on their pricing. Uh, this goes back to what we we're talking about in the, in the, causing some of the instability. Here's the, uh, you guys have heard the, the, the acronym PIGS, right? Um, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and Greece. If you look at, these are the 10-year yields from each of those countries. Now, this is sorely out of date because it was uh, done last week. Because there's so, I uh, <laughs> apologize for that. But when you look at, when you look at the 10-year treasury, which is now down to about 2%, I might add, versus the PIG countries, we're, the market is clearly pricing in a, um, a default. And if there's a default, then you have a dissolution of the European Union. And when, when bonds are trading at 17 18%, they're, they're pricing in a default. Um, back on the uh, commercial real estate side, um, you can see that we've, got, we st we've worked our way through a lot of maturities but we still have a lot more to go. We've got $900 billion of debt maturing through 2013. The vast majority of that is bank debt. Um, a lot of the loans, there's still no other option other than foreclosure. But th the good news is there's a lot of money that is out there that's going to take um, some of these things, a, a lot of this out, and it's going to get restructured. There are going to be more equity investments and, and uh, uh, get recapitalized the way they should. So. Kicking the can down the road while everybody was very concerned about that seems to be working pretty well. Uh, in the CMBS world, you can see that uh, it's been pretty steady. I think there's about $76 billion of um, uh, troubled loans in the, in the special servicers. And that's remained pretty steady. The loans get worked out or foreclosed, and then new, new troubles come in. But the interesting thing is, we're not providing enough replacement loans to uh, the CMBS market. So as a percentage of the total outstanding balance, we're creeping up. That 12.7% uh, percentage of total outstanding CMBS loans is because loans are amortizing and we're not putting new, enough new loans on the book. So it is becoming an increasingly bigger piece of the CMBS world. Um, the bank troubled loan update, you can see that uh, there's still a lot of properties that are trading water. Um, you know, o, uh, REO properties are, are pretty steady, and uh, uh, LIBOR at, what is LIBOR, 0.25, or is it below that now? I don't know. But it, low, low rates are still keeping a lot of these loans uh, in the treading water phase versus uh, having monetary defaults. And that's allowing assets to kind of work themselves out. 
if you look at the, uh, this is the commercial real estate delinquency by the lender type. So in the CMBS world, it's at a pretty high rate. 9% on a delinquency rate is, uh, is probably higher than you want it to be. But if you look at the bank rate at um, 4%, still probably not what you want to be. Everybody's been giving Fannie and Freddie a, a very hard time. They probably deserve it on the single family side. On the commercial real estate side, you can see that they're at very, very low rates. The, the multifamily loans that Fannie and Freddie are making are making a ton of money for those two entities and been very, very successful. And then, obviously, the portfolio lenders, the life companies, uh, have very, very low default rates. So they're making good loans. They're making good money. Um, and that's why they're still very much in business. Uh, here's the sales volume. So far, we are at, uh, as I said before, $97 billion. Um, it looks like we're going to beat 2010, if nothing crazy happens between now and the end of the year. And we'll probably get back to the 2004, maybe 2005 levels, uh, which is good. We're, we're, we're creeping back a lot faster than I think a lot of us would have predicted three years ago. This kind of breaks out for you the, where the investments are going, from primary market, secondary market, tertiary market. What this slide tells you is there's still so much of the money is concentrated towards the primary markets. There's really a, a vast difference between class A primary markets and secondary markets and class B and C assets. So uh, most of the money out there, institutional quality is, is chasing the, the trophy deals and the trophy markets. Uh, it is very illiquid in the class B and C uh, markets and also in the, in the tertiary markets. We're starting to see creep. Things are happening. We're starting to see the Oklahoma cities and the Tulsa's and markets like that that you know, a year ago were still pretty much shut out. Money needs yield. It's, yields are being driven down in the primary markets and it's creeping out uh, towards the secondary markets. But still, product type, class B minus C product is still very hard to get capitalized. Um, CMBS issuance to date, as I said, was about 21 billion. We thought it was going to be 35 to 40. I don't think that's going to happen uh, because of the recent dislocation. But uh, deals can still get done. We are closing CMBS deals this week, in fact, and it's just really a matter of, of pricing. And the bonds, these CMBS bonds, when they get securitized, there's still a high demand for them because, again, the need for yield. It's just how do you price it? Commercial real estate spreads over the past couple of months, you can see have widened 75 to 100 basis points. Um, you saw that in some other slides earlier. But this is a, uh, this is actually a pretty interesting slide. If you look at the spread, and I think you had something similar to this in your world, um, 250 basis points spread between property cap rates and corporate treasuries. And so when we ask ourselves, why are cap I mean, why is there still so much money pouring into real estate? That's it. It's it's just a better uh, risk-adjusted return right now. Uh, when you look at the spreads to U.S. Treasuries, it's still it's huge. It's 400 basis points, historically very high. And what this slide shows you is when sales volume, the, the higher sales volume goes, the lower that spread is, right? When sales volume goes down, there's not as much transactions, cap rate dislocation, and the spread is high. So again, why does money continue to pour into commercial real estate? That's one of the reasons. Um, cap rates by property type, multifamily continues to be the uh, favored nation property type, but um, a lot of the other, I mean, there's maybe, what, 100 basis points in between industrial and, and multifamily. That is primarily due to the fact that the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, are still uh, loaning a lot of money. The life companies are um, still are very active in loaning to multifamily, and there's just more liquidity in that marketplace than any other product type. When you think about what big institutional uh, real estate investors are trying to achieve right now, and this is kind of blows me away, a big pension fund who is charged with investing billions and billions of dollars of uh, money into real estate for their employees or teachers or plumbers or whoever. Um, they're trying to target a 10-year 
unleveraged internal rate of return of anywhere from six to seven percent. That used to be 10 to 11 percent. And it's still a huge spread over 10 year treasury. I mean, that's, you know, we're still 400 basis points over the 10 year treasury. But when you look at buying an asset and saying, I want to try to get a six to maybe 7% return over 10 years, and you're talking about having inflation adjustments along the way, that's why we're seeing cap rates today, some assets being traded at four and a half to five and a half percent cap rates. And they're, they're pricing in those inflation assumptions. Uh, to try to get to that 6 to 7%. The question right now is, with the economy uh, being a little shaky, can you get away with those inflation assumptions that, um, that they're having to, to price in to get their overall projected yield? So our summary is that CMBS market is, is taking a knee right now. They're being cautious. They're, they're, you can get deals done, but it's, it's, a, it's a pricing issue. The portfolio lenders are still very much open for business. Uh, the banks, we're seeing the banks being very aggressive on their lending. They're, they're not being aggressive on loan to, their total loan to cost. They're not being aggressive on how they underwrite, but they are wanting to get good business done, and they're being really aggressive on pricing and, and going after top-tier projects and top-tier borrowers. Um, debt rates are still just ridiculously low in historical context. And so when we look at what's propping up, you know, continues to prop up real estate values, it is and has been for a very long time based on the cost of debt. Um, lenders, investors still picky. They're looking for great product, location, sponsorship. They are creeping out to the secondary markets, but if you've got, um, you know, lower class assets and lower class markets, it's still a very, very tough um, product to get capitalized, even if the yields are risk-adjusted, and they are. I mean, right now, cap rates on trophy assets are in the fives, and cap rates in Class C, we were just talking a little while ago, Class C multifamily, even in, in primary markets, are, are probably at 10, so a huge spread between the two. Um, equity investors are remaining still very much under-allocated. There are, there are billions and billions of dollars more on the sideline wanting to invest than there are uh, deals to be had, primarily because that those billions of dollars are still not creeping into the other markets and the other uh, product types. Um, our concern, based on what we're seeing in the economy, is are the equity investors going to readjust how they underwrite deals? Are they going to take this uncertainty in the marketplace and put that down on paper and dial back their assumptions, and because of that, um, lower, lower their pricing. And it's too soon to tell. Um, it, it really, for us, is um, a question of trying to have some kind of certainty in the market. And so when we have um, all this uncertainty, whether it's you know, domestically, politically based, or, or uh, what we're seeing in Europe, that's how it manifests itself in our business. It's just uncertainty creates some guy at a computer wanting to know, can I put 3% as my growth assumptions, or should it be zero, or should it be one? And that's how uh, pricing decisions get made and whether or not transactions happen. Um, the great news for us in this room is that Texas, from a commercial real estate perspective, truly is one of the bright spots, not just in the country, but, but we're starting to see global money come into Texas. And global money has always been a little pickier. They wanted to be in the, in the, uh, the gateway markets, the, you know, the Washington DCs and the LAs and the New Yorks. And uh, we are now seeing that money come into Texas because it just is got job growth and the fundamentals of our real estate are, are great. The, the supply demand is very much in balance. You are going to see a fair amount of new multifamily come on line in Houston in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, we think that's justified and warranted. If you look at the numbers, we don't think that supply and demand are going to get out of balance. We're seeing new office buildings being built. Uh, we think that that's very much warranted. So the, the capital markets are they are aggressive. They're not stupid. Uh, they're underwriting the right way. And um, we just are very lucky that we are sitting here in Houston, Texas.